Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Vital Descent. I'm your host, as always, Patrick McFarlane. This episode is episode number 273, and the show notes may be found at vitaldescent.com forward slash 273. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about Julian Assange and the precedent that was set with his plea. Of course, we get the bombshell news coming out on Wednesday, I think maybe Tuesday, that Julian Assange has been freed pursuant to a plea deal that he came to with the United States government, uh, with the prosecutors in that case. And there's been a lot of concern, and we're going to get into these details, about what is the precedent set with this plea? Do we have to you know, temper our celebration of Assange being free with the you know, bad legal precedent that is set going forward with his plea and now is the United States going to be able to charge anyone in the world with espionage, even if they're not a United States citizen? So we're going to be tackling that question. That's going to be in the first half of the show. And in the second half of the show, I'm going to give updates for folks who are longtime listeners of the show. Um, and you feel free to stick around, you know, if you want to see what's coming out next. I do have Oppenheimer, The Truth About Oppenheimer Part 2 updates coming up in the second half. So if you uh, listen to the show because you do like that and you're looking forward to part two, which would be a year in the making, um, I'm going to talk about that in the second half. So starting off first, we have, oh, also, yes, uh, today is Justin Raimondo five years since he passed away, since I'm the anti-war, uh, excuse me, since I am the Justin Raimondo fellow at the Libertarian Institute, I just want to tip my hat to Justin Raimondo on five years since his passing here. Head on to, this will be coming out a day or two later, but head over to antiwar.com and uh, check out his columns. I think they're at antiwar.com forward slash Justin is his archive there. So go check that out. All right, let's start with Consortium News, this article. I'll put a link in the show notes page. Again, vitaldescent.com forward slash 273. Joe Loria writes, the WikiLeaks, uh, Julian Assange is finally free, June 24th, 24. The WikiLeaks publisher left Belmarsh Prison on Monday morning and departed the UK headed to Australia, WikiLeaks said. So Joe Loria writes, Julian Assange has agreed to a plea deal with the United States. He left Belmarsh on Monday and is headed to Australia, WikiLeaks said. Quote, he was granted bail by the High Court in London and was released at Stansted Airport during the afternoon where he boarded a plane and departed the UK, WikiLeaks said in a tweet early Tuesday morning, London time. Stella Assange tweeted, Julian is free. Words cannot express our immense gratitude to you, yes, you, who have all mobilized for years and years to make this come true. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this is incredible, obviously. Like, I, I still can't believe that this actually happened. I mean... I guess it just goes to show, and I think Caitlin Johnstone tweeted this out, that it really is incredible how just things could happen. Things that seemed impossible could just happen. And that this was really one of those things. So Assange was released as a result of a plea deal with the United States, the BBC reported. The national broadcaster said, according to CBS, the BBC's U.S. partner, Assange, will spend no time in U.S. custody and will receive credit for the time spent incarcerated in the UK. Assange will return to Australia, according to a letter from the Justice Department. The deal which will see him plead guilty to one charge is expected to be finalized in a court in the Northern Mariana Islands on Wednesday, the 22nd of June. New York Times reported that Assange agreed to the one count of the Espionage Act, quote, conspiracy to disseminate national defense information in exchange for a five-year sentence, which the U.S. agreed had already been served on remand in Belmarsh. So there's here's a video. Um, I'm not going to really belabor this. Like I'm, I'm a little bit late to the punch, and I'm sure that you guys, you know, if you're consuming media, you've probably uh, watched other shows that have recapped the facts here with Julian Assange and taking that plea deal and those details. But the thing that I can offer that's different from every other show is how to explain why this does not actually set a precedent, a legal precedent going forward. I think there is significant concern about um, normalizing the fact that the United States can exercise its jurisdiction across the world 
basically jailing any uh, journalist anywhere ever who deals with facts that the U.S. government has stated are um, are classified and just basically that the United States is the world's policeman is, is of great concern. Uh, but I did tweet this out on Twitter the other day saying that, well, it doesn't actually set a real legal precedent. And of course, I'll walk you through that. Um, but I think it was pointed out to me that Essentially, the precedent was set when these charges were leveled in the first place. And of course, there's all these political considerations that go with, but the fact that the United States would feel emboldened to do this in the first place, I think it was Misty Winston who pointed this out, uh, who we had on the show talking about Assange's appeal just the other um, just the other month. Assange Fights for Freedom, episode 270, uh, vitaldescent.com forward slash 270 where she had said that basically the fact that this was charged in the first place, that's that precedent is already set. It, it's the informal precedent that isn't binding legal precedent. But it seems that, you know, I was talking with Dave DeCam from antiwar.com about this issue specifically, and he's going to do a show about it when he gets back from Australia, just ironically, um, on Sunday, not really irony, but just uh, it's a coincidence he's there when this happens and Julian is freed. But essentially, explaining this, it's hard for people who are non-lawyers or who are not familiar with the criminal justice system in the United States and um, kind of the British, like the Anglo-American legal system that we covered in this show. If you're not familiar with it, it can be a little hard to wrap your head around exactly why this doesn't set a legal precedent. And um, I'm going to I'm going to read this part from Consortium News, which kind of explains it and then go through it myself with my own explanation. So Bruce Afran, Afran, Bruce Afran, a U.S. constitutional lawyer, and Marjorie Cohen, former president of the U.S. National Lawyers Guild, both told Consortium News that a plea deal does not create a legal precedent. Therefore, Assange's plea, uh, Assange's deal would not jeopardize journalists in the future of being prosecuted for accepting and publishing classified information from a source because of Assange's agreeing to such a charge. And I, I just want to like take a second to pat myself on the back because I said this in the group chat, albeit um, moments after I heard that Assange had taken a plea deal because I I'm not on Twitter anymore. Like I still have my account, but I'm not using it. But I found out. Because I I think I I don't I in a group in a different group chat it, someone was talking about it and that's how I found out. But I said you know actually I don't think that this does set a precedent because there there is no legal precedent being set here. Um, Afran said this this lawyer said quote a plea is not precedent precedent consists of a decision interpreting a matter of law by an appeals court that will govern future cases on the same legal principle. In contrast, a plea is merely a factual agreement by a given defendant that they did a certain act, but does not bind future defendants in similar cases. Okay, gobbledygook. What does that mean, legalese? Uh, yikes. Let's let's unpack that. But he says further, or sh- he or she, no, Bruce Afran, Afran. Uh, he says, for example, if Julian chooses to drop his First Amendment defenses and plead guilty, this does not mean that a similar defendant in the future does not have a for double negative, that a similar defendant in the, in the future is without a First Amendment defense in an Espionage Act case. No appeals court has decided such issues, and Julian's plea does not bind future courts or future parties, nor will it ever be considered in any other defendant's case. There's a doctrine that a person is bound to a factual decision, including a plea, only if they participated in that case. This means that no future defendant will ever be impacted legally, either by fact or law, as a result of Julian's guilty plea. It has no precedental um, precedental value or effect. So, understanding this and really wrapping your head around it really requires someone to explain how the judicial system works in the United States. So it works similarly at the, at the state level system that it does at the federal system. I am like, technically I'm admitted to practice in federal court. I I have um, a certificate that hangs on the wall of my office that says I 
theoretically, if I had a federal case, I could practice in the federal district of Wisconsin. I think there's two Wisconsin districts, I think. But I do, you know, most of my criminal defense work, all of it is in, in the, uh, the state court of Wisconsin. But essentially, there's different tiers to the court system within Wisconsin and any state in the United States and in the federal courts. So you have your circuit court in Wisconsin. It's called circuit, circuit court. Uh, in the federal level, it's called the district court. And these courts are the fact-finding courts. These are the trial-level courts. So you don't have a trial in an appellate kit court. So there's the bottom-level circuit court. Then there's the appellate court that is the intermediate court. And then you have the Supreme Court, which is on top of that. So um, like in the state courts, every state court system has the, like the, the circuit court in Wisconsin, for instance. In other states, I think they have district courts or... Louisiana does some weird civil law thing. They're different. Um, so you have, yeah, circuit court, appellate court, and Supreme Court. Most of your, like, most cases that you have are going to happen at the circuit court level. I, almost all of them. And that is the trial level court. So you have, I don't know, you get caught with a bag of weed and you get charged with simple possession. You're going to be have your trial at the circuit court level. You're going to have witnesses that are being cross-examined and direct examination. You're going to have evidence be entered. You're going to have, you know, documents, body camera footage, the bag of weed, scientific testing. You're going to have experts testify. You're going to do all those things. You're going to write motions and challenge evidence and take on Miranda issues and um, do all those things at the circuit court level. And let's say that you're in the middle, you get caught with a bag of weed and your Patrick McFarlane is appointed to represent you or you hire me to represent you. We're going to make our challenges. Um, so before trial, you can make challenges to evidence and what evidence comes in. Or like if, if a complaint is sufficient to sustain uh, the charges, essentially, like I don't know, let's say they charge you with possession, but but the DA never alleges that you had knowledge that the weed was on you or something like that. Or it's clear from the face of the complaint that you had no knowledge that the bag was on you. Then, this is just an example. Or, I don't know, let's say that you're being charged with battery, but there's no allegation that you ever hit anyone. Um, then you can make a challenge on the face of the complaint to dismiss or you could make a challenge to, let's say, a police officer pulled you over and it turns out that, um, I don't know, that he pulled you over and then he searched your person. But the problem is, is that he never had any reason to pull you over to begin with. Then you can challenge, do a motion to suppress any derivative evidence from that stop. So, or like I have a case right now where I'm writing a motion to suppress where my client was the passenger in a vehicle and the vehicle was pulled over and the cops saw um, a, like a, a pill bottle filled with marijuana sticking out of the pocket of the driver. And he just pulled the driver out and searched the driver and he told his partner to search the passenger in the vehicle. Well, that you can't do that because, well, that's what, my, what I'm arguing is that you can't do that because you don't have probable cause to search the passenger. You need probable cause that the passenger is committing a crime to search that person incident to arrest because that's the only way that you can search someone, like do a full body search of someone is incident to arrest. So I know this is a lot of information um, and it's, it's a complicated subject. So at the circuit court level, I can make those motions. Uh, we can go further and we can go to like a trial and after I've made all those motions and, you know, maybe there's a mistake made at the trial. Well, or, or maybe the judge made a mistake when he ruled on one of those motions to suppress evidence that I was talking about before or a motion to dismiss the complaint. Maybe the judge made a mistake. At that point in time, I could appeal or the, the state could appeal and the case gets kicked up to the appellate court. Um, when the case gets kicked up to the appellate court, 
then the appellate court is going to rule on whether the circuit court made a mistake and they're going to interpret the law, they're going to interpret other rulings, and they're going to say what the law is and how that applies and apply that law to your case. And at that point, that is when legal precedent is made. So a decision at the circuit court level has no bearing on future cases. That's exactly what this attorney is saying. It works the same way in the federal courts. There's federal district courts, um, and that's where all the trial stuff happens. So if you commit, if you violate federal law, you're going to be arrested and charged in a federal district court. And in that case, you know, whatever happens in your case, unless, you know, there's an appeal and it gets kicked up to the appellate courts, um, it's not going to create binding precedent at all. So if, if, let's say that I'm being charged with a crime like Julian Assange, and I don't necessarily agree with the crime, I don't think it's constitutional, because Julian Assange could have, in theory, done this. Um, he could have challenged the case on constitutional grounds. Now, there's all this other stuff about jurisdiction and if he's submitting himself to the court, if he decides to fight and litigate his case within the United States courts, um, he would be maybe like waiving some of his jurisdictional objections if he had done this. Um, but if he had decided to challenge the case on First Amendment grounds and the court ruled that he couldn't challenge the case on First Amendment grounds, that the First Amendment does not protect him against an espionage charge, then that ruling still wouldn't create legal precedent unless Julian Assange appealed it and it went to an appeals court and the appeals court said, actually, Julian, you don't have First Amendment protection. That would create binding legal precedent. Um, and that never happened in this case. So at, at the circuit court level, say we're back in circuit court where I'm the lawyer, um, if my client doesn't agree with the facts of what happened, but I say, hey, you know, I hate to break it to you, but I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. Your version of what happened, no one's going to buy that. And I don't have the tools, the factual tools necessary to win your case at trial. Maybe I do, but do you want to pay me, I don't know, five or $10,000 to find out and then pro probably lose anyways? Like, in one case, I, I had a guy who was being charged with disorderly conduct, and it comes out through our, our discussions that he was drunk, visibly intoxicated at the time. And he says that he never had an altercation uh, with his neighbor. But come to find out that he was drunk, and the police officers, when I got the discovery in the body camera footage, said he was drunk. And on the body camera footage, he appears to be very heavily intoxicated. I say, bro, you cannot win this case. Even if you don't agree that you were, um, you know, disorderly, basically, you can either enter a guilty plea or a no contest plea, essentially agreeing, even if you don't agree in theory, that you're not going to win the case and that you were, you know, uh, committing uh, disorderly conduct at the time. Again, you can agree to whatever the facts are, and you can agree to any facts as long as the state agrees with those facts, but you can stipulate to those facts and stipulate that you're guilty, and it doesn't create any kind of binding precedent at all. So I, I hope that that kind of elucidated and explained and helped people understand I mean, I know it's it's like can be complicated to someone. You know, I remember the my first week of law school. Uh, I came home and my brain hurt, like my brain was tired, and I don't think I'd ever experienced that before. Just that kind of, and I experienced it my first week or two weeks as a lawyer practicing law, and it was like my my head hurt, like it was weary and tired on the inside of my head. And uh, that was just a strange thing. So, yeah, there's 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 a whole lot more to it, obviously, but this is a general thing. I mean, there's even exceptions like if you so if you uh, 
let's say I'm being charged with a crime. I bring a motion to dismiss saying that, you know, bringing a constitutional defense, saying that, you know, it's an overly broad statute or something like that. If I lose at the circuit court level and I appeal it to the appellate court level and the appeals court looks at it, there's even certain instances where a three-judge panel in the appeals court can make a ruling on an appeal from the circuit court, and it's still not binding precedent because it's not a published case. So you're not allowed to cite an unpublished case, even if it's from the appellate court level, except for persuasive value. So I don't know if, if people, people watching just don't... Uh, you know, if you're listening to this and that is hard to wrap your head around, it makes sense when you've been dealing with it for a number of years. But it's like back in the day, there was no Internet to research cases. And there was like different reporters who would take published court opinion or they would take court opinions and they would publish them in huge volumes. So if you ever go to like an old attorney's office and you go into their conference room or even in maybe their office office, on the wall behind them, they have all, like, or you go to the courthouse, they'll have like these huge shelves full of these old, dusty, worn, leather-bound books that have like numbers on the back. And those, that is where like the court cases were published. There would be new editions put out every so often and new volumes put out every so often, but they would sell them as a set. And before the internet, attorneys would either have to buy, you know, these books or they would have to go to like a law library or they would go to the courthouse to do research by opening these books and finding the case, the cases published in them. So that's how it works in our, um, in our common law system. That's called the common law where you have a, a body of law that comes about through time, through these court opinions being published. Uh, the, the courts, it's judge-made law, essentially. Not, not necessarily conscious judge, like activist judge-made law, because uh, a judge's job is to say what the law is and not what they think it should be. But saying what the law is takes applying past decisions and applying those past decisions to a set of facts that are novel to you. And so once, you know, and, and again, it bubbles up. So it's not just like, oh, well, we have, you know, a trial that was won in this case at the circuit level. That doesn't create binding precedent. It has to be appealed because there has to be an appealable question. And then the judges, a lot of this is kind of like safeguards against like um, activist judges, right? Because uh, um, there's this whole idea of stare decisis and like the the supreme court can't just of its own accord pick a case that they want to overturn it it ha there has to be like an aggrieved party with a controversy and there's all these other this is like constitutional law 101 uh but there has to be standing which is you know an aggrieved party that has a real controversy at law so Anyways, um, I hope that helps you guys kind of understand exactly why the Assange plea doesn't create binding precedent that we have to worry about going forward. So at any rate, I think that answers that question. Let's, uh, let's transition a little bit more, kind of a similar topic, but um, my experience in, in the last little bit here, because uh, I haven't put out an episode in like two months here, it's it's been eating away at me, but I've been crazy busy. And I did write a newsletter article about this uh, when it, shortly after it happened. So this was um, April 23rd at my membership website, my newsletter website, vitaldescent.club. So you can check that out here. Uh, it's entitled, I Learned Something Today. And so in April, April was a really busy month for me and I got really burned out. And then the, it was like that happened and then the national convention happened and like I got really burned out on libertarians and libertarianism and at any rate. But it started with 
One weekend, the weekend before my first jury trial, I gave the speech at the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin convention, and I talked about um, the public defender crisis that's going on, not just in Wisconsin, but across the country, where, uh, I mean, it's really a criminal justice crisis, and I talked about it on this show in the past, and I can't remember exactly when that was. It was like a year, a few years ago back when I was still Liberty Weekly. And I really detail, I won't belabor it now, but it Liberty Week, or excuse me, vitaldescent.com forward slash 233. It's entitled, This Constitutional Crisis May Collapse the Criminal Justice System. And I did a whole speech, which I'm hoping to run as an episode of the show, because I think it was a good speech. Um... But essentially how, yeah, there's there's not enough lawyers, the SPD offices, uh, the public defend, state public defender offices aren't being funded properly. Uh, they conflict, uh, like the, the public defender will conflict out of cases and they have to hire private attorneys to take the conflicted cases. And they're underfunded. They pay like less than half of the market rate. I'm one of these private lawyers that take public defender cases on contract. And my private rate is more than twice what the public rate is for those cases. And so I don't have much incentive to take them aside from it's good, like it's, it's a good, uh, good practice for me. And like, um, it's a guaranteed paycheck. You're not going to have people like short you on the money. And yeah, they're, they're hard cases and there, but there's a lot of cases and prosecutions, prosecutors, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, like offices, DA's offices are having trouble staffing, all this stuff. So I went through that, I think the Saturday before my first jury trial, which started on like a Tuesday, the following Tuesday. And I went through the jury trial. I won the jury trial. It was a fel a G felony theft. So in Wisconsin, like in the seriousness of felonies goes from like a would be first degree intentional homicide is one of them b c d e f g h um h and i so the g level felony is like it's a lower level felony but it's still a felony punishable with like multiple years in prison so um i won the jury trial it was a two day long jury trial it was like april 17th and 18th or something like that um <clears throat> and that was a crazy experience. Uh, I, I felt obviously very, very good winning the trial. And it was a theft case. So it was like my client was accused of stealing more than $10,000 worth of stuff. And everything went really well the way that I had planned it. I busted my ass uh, on this case. I worked like, I don't know, 13 or 14 hour days from... Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, and the trial ended at like 7.30. And so that, that was crazy. So I got burned out from that experience. And then the national convention happened, and I just got sick and tired of libertarians in general. And um, yeah, so it's been hard to put out content since then. But in the meantime, I like have been wondering if I should put out content like bust my ass to put out like an episode a week like I usually do and never get Oppenheimer part two done or this long form documentary content that I really would like to do. Um, or, and I want to put out an ebook with the Oppenheimer part two release uh, to help build that email list, which I think I, I did announce on the podcast the last couple episodes. Um, but at any rate, I am working on The Truth About Oppenheimer Part 2. Uh, here's a copy of the script. Uh, I've released parts of it to the email list before, but I've been working on it the last couple weeks. And so there's like eight pages of text. And we're kind of getting to the part, like I'm getting into where people are being injected with plutonium, and it's brutal. And so I want to tell the story like finish with the story of all the people who were injected with plutonium by the Manhattan Project. And I think that I'm coming, I'm kind of like halfway through it. 
So I just want to finish that and then get it to Mises Pieces and we can work on getting that finished. And I want it to be done by the end of the summer is my goal. Um, so that's an update kind of on where I'm at. I think I've, I've learned, you know, over the past bit here, I've learned a lot about myself um, over the years. And I've noticed a pattern, which you guys might have noticed over the years, is that I get, I don't know if it's like ADHD or something like that, is starting all these projects and not being able to finish them or something coming up. Um, but a lot of that happens with burnout, where I get super intensely focused on something and hyper focus on that and then um, just get tired and the next thing comes up, the next emergency and the next thing to jump to. So if you um, if you like the work that I'm doing, you wanna get updates on the Oppenheimer part two documentary, The Truth About Oppenheimer, uh, head on over to vitaldescent.club, go to the lower right-hand corner and hit that subscribe button there. Um, you'll be prompted, you can sign up for free and get the free content or you can support and help me pay the production fees for The Truth About Oppenheimer Part 2. Um, you'll see there uh, getting thank you credits at the end of every episode and documentary. That's something that I'm offering uh, for support. I'm also um, putting a thank you credit, a personalized thank you email for me, but also a credit at the end of the documentary for that. Um, and I'm looking at other like bonuses to give some realistic ones that people are going to enjoy. I was doing extra like, you know, bonus episodes and stuff like that, but I was making it and literally no one was watching it. So I think that people really, and you tell me what you, if you're a fan of the show, you tell me what you want to see in bonuses, but I think they just want a personalized connection or they just want to help support my work, um, which I really truly do appreciate. Um, I think about it all the time when I think about, Liberty or uh, <laughs> Vital Descent stuff and um, really want to put out long form documentary content for you guys. This Oppenheimer thing, like I'm passionate about it. It's going to be a great thing. Part one was really great, but at this point in time, it's been like a three year long project and I just want to finish it and move on to something else that I can make a long form documentary about. But okay. I have a couple uh, ideas for episodes coming up and uh, we're going to see how that translates. But I am working on the script, hoping to be done with it soon so we can get to the next stage of production. Okay, so these are all the folks that support Vital Descent. I want to thank each and every one of you. Chandler, shout out Chandler, uh, Andre, Philip, Jesse, Jan, Andreas, G. Cross, Virginia, Jack, Scott, Troy, Nick, uh, Melanie, Ovidiu, um, Adrian, Donald, Zygodactyl, um, and Connor Freeman. Thanks, Connor. And Lee, thank you guys. Really appreciate your support. Um, your support is what helps make this possible, producing Oppenheimer Part 2. And... Um, yeah, gives me the warm and fuzzies. So thank you guys. Looking forward for more content and we'll catch you next time. Peace.